if you're doing it for a hobby, the idea of investing in something like this is you just because you're not in it for a business. Mm -hmm. But we're like, yeah, we're, look, we're in this as a business. Let's do things that businesses do, which is invest in the infrastructure. Don't worry, AJ. We know how to get in our own trouble. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> I won't worry about that then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're we're pretty good at drum that up. Good job. You. All yeah. right. Good job. <laughs> For sure. Welcome to Barbell Business. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson and Marcus Gersey, and we have traveled to the sunny Mesa, Arizona, and uh, we're here with AJ Richards, CEO, founder of Rush Club. And also, well, in CrossFit Mesa. Yeah. That's what we're doing here. So right. You've been an affiliate for five years. Yes. Uh, you've also created another brand, uh, Rush Club, that's been uh, taking off. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, we want to visit and take a journey, see your journey, your entrepreneurial journey, and see uh, where you came from. Um, where did you start? Uh, what, what made you want to open up a CrossFit gym in the first place? Uh, so after the military, uh, I found a a CrossFit gym and loved it. Didn't know what I wanted to do. I was selling pest control. Um, I had a dog that sniffed out bed bugs. So we were traveling the valley, searching <laughs> hotels and houses for bed bugs. And it was. You, did you train the dog? No. Uh, <laughs> I, pro I probably made, I found more bed bugs than the dog did because I made the dog worse. It was not the best job for me. So I was doing that. <laughs> I'm serious. We'd show up, and my dog would just sit there and look at me, and I'm like, we got a job to do, man. So I'd, I'd be like. What kind, of, what kind of dog is this? I, yeah, want, it was I a, want a visual. It was a beagle. A I was imagining a beagle. <laughs> it's a beagle. <laughs> so we're, like, going around the bed, and I'm like, the, the owner's watching, and I'm like, I'm looking because I know he's not working because he gave me the whole signals of, like, I don't give a shit today. I'm not going to do anything. So we just drove clear across the valley. So I'm like pulling the sheets apart just so I could do my job, too. I found more bugs than that stupid dog did. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I knew I wanted to be Was an not expecting that to be one of the stats <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is the yeah. best start ever. Yeah, so uh, I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, so that that's how that started, but that was not the right place for me, and I was really enjoying my training with CrossFit. Loved it and, and became a coach, and I knew at, at some point I just realized that's what I wanted to do was open a CrossFit gym. So... Um, we opened in CrossFit Mesa. First, it was in my garage in way out in a place far from here uh, for about two months. And I realized that this just wasn't going to work in our location. And so um, I actually tried to affiliate as CrossFit Mesa, but I didn't have a Mesa address yet. Mm -hmm. So I just found a cheap, like, re like a storage unit almost. It was like a 1,000 square feet, and it was 500 bucks a month. And I'm like, okay, so how many people do I need to just make that work. If I'm not making anything, I'm still going to work my job, but I got to just at least cover $500 a month. So I went to this place and the, the, the insulation and the ceiling was falling down and we had, a, you know, we're in Mesa, which is 120 degrees in the summer. So we had a swamp cooler trying to cool people off. Mm. So that's where we started. I've, tra um, I've trained here in the summer before and, and gyms where the doors are just open. Yeah. Like what? The <laughs> Brutal. Fuck? Yeah. Brutal. We, it's a big step up for people to be able to walk into a CrossFit gym that has air conditioning in, in Arizona. Well, if you're not <laughs> if you're not from here and then you like step right into it, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's devastating. Yeah, it's yeah. devastating. Actually, me me and Mike actually grew up in Mesa when we were super young, independently before we knew each other, That's just out right. of total, total coincidence. Yeah, we so, were we were roommates in college and noticed mm -hmm. that our social security numbers were too much alike <laughs> to be. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's strange. That's yeah. Funny. So I, I remember doing gymnastics when I was a little kid. So I started doing gymnastics when I was four, and I did it until I moved away from Arizona. And then, then a little bit when I lived in Washington. But uh -huh. um, I remember the summertime when it's just big bay doors open, and, and they got fans, but it's right. 120. <laughs> like, I remember one day it was 127 degrees out, and it was just, like, the most brutal practice. Because <laughs> yeah. you, just, you just can't work out in that kind of heat. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, and so we would get to the point where we had – <clears throat> two swamp we had a swamp cooler in the ceiling and we bought another one that we had to keep taking buckets of water from the bathroom and pour it into the base of it you could buy the swamp cooler from costco mm. just to try to keep the place cooled off enough 
it, sometimes you'd like go to touch the the roll up door and it would burn your hand because it you know it's, it's the sun and so <laughs> it was crazy. But you know that's where we started. So within so we opened the gym. Literally within three months, I had to move across the parking lot, the same complex, to one that was a, a pull-through unit. So it was two units back-to-back, -back, and now we had 2,000 square feet. And then three more months, we had to blow the wall out, and we took 3,000 square feet. And and even in that spot, we so we had this L shape, and the, the, the unit that was next to us, they did seats for motorcycles. And so the glue, the, the, the smell mm. of the glue would seep over we were like training high half so the time. So your members were just puffing glue all day. <laughs> yes, it was. I mean, we they were addicted to the training. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, that's right. They were like they they were jonesing if they didn't show up, you know. So <laughs> scratch themselves. Yeah. Like, gotta go to the gym. You gotta get to the gym. <laughs> so so that's where we started, and then um, we moved here to this space in uh, uh, let's see, 2013. Like real, we within a within a year and a half. We just outgrew it, and I'm like, let's just go for it. So we, the, the space had been empty for so long that the landlord just didn't want to pay taxes, I think, because we, we literally pay 50 cents a square foot, including nice. triple net. You guys are on a main boulevard right here. Yeah. What? Dragon. Yep. That's killer. We moved into this place paying 3200 bucks a month. 6,000 square feet on a hard corner, major intersection. Because I think, I, obviously, I think we're just paying his tax, property tax, because it was empty for so long. He didn't want to deal with that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's had a 3% increase each year, so we're up to 4,100. But okay, wow. that's totally fine. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's so, that, but it made it work for the only, that's the only way we were able to go to a place like this. And then, it, you know, it kind of legitimized our particular affiliate because we were no longer in a warehouse and a lot of them at that time still were especially in 2013 a lot mm -hmm. of gyms were still doing the warehouse thing and so to see a crossfit gym in a freestanding retail location on a hard corner I, I think did a lot for us and with the traffic driving by and everything mm -hmm. so it's kind of been the evolution of uh, of our the, where we've come from here so that whole time you were saying we who is we uh I, I've always you're, you're got a team. team. Yeah. So I mean, it's been me and my wife. I've I've actually gone through a lot of partners. Um, fortunately, we've able to been able to do it in a way where we we become we still friends at the end. But if there's any lesson I've learned over time, it's how to find the right partners and when partners work and don't work. Um, that you know that's been that's been a challenge. I mean, the mm -hmm. first partner I had w probably had never should never be in the fitness business. Um, he's not fit at all, and if he would cover a class for me, it was like. People are like, why is this guy coaching class, right? Because he was completely sedentary and that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. But without him, the the blessing is without him coming in, this wouldn't be started. So, you know, everybody plays their role somehow. And then it's just an evolution of that. And how do you be – how do you have integrity with people to be able to break things off in a way that's not like one person screwing the other? Because there's always a way to do it with integrity mm -hmm. if conver if the right conversations happen. Yeah. So we, We've actually seen that happen a lot. Yeah. Um, and we've done it ourselves. Like we've had business partners and been involved in other businesses where it just didn't work out. Right. And yeah, it's, there's always, you know, you know, having really the balls to follow through and, and breaking up with a relationship. I mean, yeah. anyone who's never had like a breakup in a business relationship, I mean, we can just go back to, you know, you, had, you were in high school and you had a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend and you're like, Oh, I want to break up. But no, I don't, you know, yeah. I don't have the balls to do it. But, it's, it, I mean, it's it's like it could be the same type of feeling yeah. that comes up. And, in fact, there's been a lot of people who we've advised who we get a look inside their business and we go, this partnership is, it's either, you know, it's one-sided or you don't have the right people, the right complementary pieces to make this work. And a lot of times people, even if they go into it with the right reasons, it, it doesn't quite pan out and yeah. it, you know and and a lot of it has to do with communication on the front end getting real clear on who's res actually responsible for what and so uh yeah we've learned dozens of lessons around partnerships that you know if you know and, and most people don't learn those until they've had a partner and then yeah. they they split up and they they've done it a few times right so one of the things that kind of worked for us to to really see if the partnership worked <clears throat> was Okay, what does my family want to make or need to make in revenue? Mm -hmm. What does your family want to make or need to make in revenue? What are we going to pay our head coach? What are we going to pay our coaches? And then coming together and saying, does is it 
actually makes sense that we can do that kind of revenue with this business. If it's a no, then somebody's got to go, right? If if we both want to make 150,000 a year for example, and then we want our coaches to make, you know, 50 to 75, then we have to look at the business model and say, does it sustain that? Like that, that's what we one of the big things we've learned with the templates and stuff through Logic was like there's there's no way we would get there because it's you know, our business model didn't have that sort of growth plan in it. We weren't trying to we, we weren't we didn't have a growth plan to be making seven hundred and fifty thousand a year as a CrossFit gym, which would be necessary for everybody, all the partners involved to make what they wanted. So then it's an easy com- com- conversation. It's like, well, you want to make this, but you don't necessarily want to be around that long to see it happen. We know it's not gonna happen, so who's gonna go? And then, like you said, having those bold conversations, and usually you find out if you're willing to have those bold conversations that it's the space that's left unspoken where the fear is. Then you have a conversation. You both were thinking the same same thing, mm-hmm. and sometimes they were looking for a way out, and they're like, "Oh, thank God, I'm out." <laughs> you know, I've experienced that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. but oh, nobody. I'm so glad you brought that yeah. up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, partnerships has been a big learning curve for us too. So now it's just my wife and I. Mm-hmm. Um, recently bought out a. a uh, partners, they were phenomenal. They had really great strengths to our weaknesses. But then it just came down to where are we taking the gym? What's going on? And and um, it's funny because I called you and you've you know mentored me a lot over the years. And I told Mike, I said, uh, yeah, I'm gonna sell because Rush Club's doing really good. Two weeks later, we talk and he, I'm like, yeah, I own the gym 100. percent And he's like, wait, what? <laughs> that's <laughs> not what we talked about. <laughs> not what we talked about. <laughs> completely <laughs> 180. I was like, I don't know what's going on. Yeah, anymore. you're unpredictable. I like it. I am very yeah. unpredictable. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to note too uh, something I've seen that's common. I think uh, Marcus, uh, you're you're talking a lot of gym owners too. I, one of the challenges I see with partnerships a lot of times is. Uh, one owner wants to make it a full time, like real business, yeah. and another owner is treating it like a hobby. Yeah. And so you have these two or three people that start this thing, and uh, yeah, uh, one or two people go all in, and there's one or two people that are kind of like, eh, you know, I'm going to keep my day job and just kind of do this on the side. Maybe it'll make some money. Maybe it won't. Not really important to me. So there's not, there's this lack of alignment around, you know, what the gym is supposed to be doing overall. But yeah, the, having that personal, like compensation perspective and that conversation is important. The the issue also arises, this is normal and I don't know if you've experienced this, but the a lot of gym owners don't care about making money in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And I think you said something about this early on, which yeah. is like, oh, we were doing this and you know, it was working out as long as I wasn't getting paid. Right. And so a lot of a lot of box owners are totally okay with not getting paid until they're a year in, and they're like, man, I put a lot into this, and mm-hmm. I've got nothing out of it financially. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of naivety to that. It's because you're so excited about the idea that you just think that everything's going to be okay. And, mm-hmm. and and in my situation, I thought we would be crushing it within a year and a half, right? But, but then really in our situation, what happened was with Rush Club taking off, it was taking a lot of my focus and my time. And so really what happened was my partner was trying to keep things going. And... I was putting in a lot of the hours, but the behind the stuff that actually grows the gym, he was doing a lot of that because I was doing all that stuff for, for a rush club. Mm-hmm. And so that's wh- ultimately what it came down to is like, he was like, Hey, look, you know, you're doing all the hours. So yeah, you're being paid for those hours. I'm not being paid a whole lot. Uh, we can't sustain this. And so the conversation came up and I says, okay, cool. How about you buy me out? And this is what I want for it. Basically I was asking for what I made in a year in salary. And, uh, um, we shopped it around. He didn't want to buy it, but we shopped it around looking for a partner. Couldn't come to the right term. And so I just flipped and I said, well, look, I'm not getting what I want out of it for that. How about I buy you out for what I was asking for? Is that fair to you? And it's double what he put in in terms of his actual capital investment. Oh, nice. And he was here for about a year. And I thought that was fair. You know, mm-hmm. I, Even though I wasn't being offered what I was asking, yeah. Yeah. I still wanted to do something that was fair for somebody. So I'm like, look... It, it's worth at least a year's salary of what I'm making here, so let me buy you out. And so we, and then what? Even better, we worked it out to where I'm only paying on a monthly buyout for the next two years. So it wasn't even a, I didn't have to come up with a mass uh, mm. amount of capital just to get to have him be out. It, yeah, it's hard for him to to not agree to those terms as well because that's what you were asking for you for. So for him to come back and argue that that's not fair is like right. not really an option. <laughs> right. Yeah. At that it, point, it was actually it was really easy. Mm-hmm. He's like, okay, fine, and I was like, okay. 
Stop selling them. Just get it done. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, get a loan to stop sell. Stop selling and start closing. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. Starting Done. starting partnerships and ending re- partnerships and relationships like that. Uh, I think a lot of times people feel like it needs to uh, it needs to be done like they've heard or seen before. And yeah. one thing I've learned is you can get as creative as you possibly want. Mm-hmm. There's no there's no like set rule on how it's supposed to be done. Right. It you can really just sit in my experiences you sit down with an attorney and you go this is this is this is the end result i want to happen can you help me get there and yeah. a good attorney is going to help make that happen right so mm-hmm. if you're right. if you're working with somebody who's not a great attorney then you know they're they're gonna be trying to get you to do certain things instead of just like getting you to where you want to be right yeah. so so what did the gym look like over the years like what, what were the dominoes that fell that took it from like kind of messy startup to like professional yeah, professionally run real company. Man, so we had um, at one point one of the, one of the first big blows to the to the business was um, I was doing so many hours. So I was doing all the coaching in the morning, then I was going to my job, and I was going back to coaching in the evening, and I did that for a long time. And so then I got in a hurry to get a bunch of trade coaches, right? And as soon as I got enough trade coaches to cover my hours, I disappeared. Like I did because I, I was burned out. It took mm. me about it, it took about eight, uh, nine months to a year for that to happen. But then I was like, "Cool, I got a coach for every hour. I'm not going in. I'm I'm just I'm done." Right? How, how long were you coaching before you you uh, experienced the burnout? About twelve months. Yeah, uh, tw- nine to twelve months where I was just it was all me. Right, mm-hmm. and so and then I and then yeah, as soon as I got coaches, and then all of a sudden what happened was I had one coach, who he coached all of the evening classes every day, all the evening classes. And then we had a falling out, and then everybody left with him that was in those evening classes mm-hmm. yeah. because mm-hmm. they were he was they were his members essentially. They yeah, didn't know bi- anybody else. Yeah, yeah he built he's the relationship. Their coach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was my that was a learning opportunity. It was like, oh yeah, so let's have my coaches rove, <laughs> you know, or at least be present enough so our members mm-hmm. know that they're here and it's AJ's gym, you know, not this individual's gym. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, the integrity part of that for me was real recognizing where I made mistakes with that coach, and and he, that guy's actually going to be here watching the open with us tonight. So nice. like he he left and took ten members, which was a big blow, and it was like this huge falling out in our community. Life's too short to have enemies. So we got together, we had a conversation about what happened. I recognized and acknowledged where I made mistakes, and he recognized and acknowledged where he made mistakes, and now we're friends. And 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 um friends again right but but that was the the learning opportunity there was like don't let somebody for me it was not to let one person be the only person that those entire that that group of members know right Mm -hmm. so my evening classes for example i have 20 people today's a slow day because it's uh yoga (laughs) so we kind of slow down but we we average 20 people per class for my four five and six p.m class if they only knew one person and i was never here and 20 people left if that happened again I wouldn't even know how to pay our bills for the next six months. That's yeah. a that's a lot of people. So now we have things in place to help with that. Do you guys do we, contracts? We do contracts now. That was something new from listening to one of the podcasts you guys have done in the past. Um, uh, at first, you know, I wanted it to be the handshake deals. Like, hey, if we do our job, you're going to show like this naivety of that. And then also realizing what, if I wanted to go to a bank for a loan mm-hmm. without any contracts, I actually have no members. Right? right, it's like who? How many members do you have? Oh, I got a hundred. Great, show me the contracts. Oh, we don't do contracts. Oh, then you have none. <laughs> right, because the next month you don't. Right, yeah, unless they actually decide to pay. No yeah. valuation. You actually yeah. literally the used equipment. Yeah. We had this conversation like once a week mm-hmm. yeah. with someone who's just like, yeah, but I've got like three hundred members and they're yeah. paying me this much. My revenue is like forty grand. It's just like. That's great, <laughs> but if you left, someone bought it off of you, or you know, you walked into class every day and were like, "F you, f you, f you," and everyone decided to walk like, yeah, tomorrow, you're out of business next week. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. Yeah, yeah and yeah, so, the, sorry, go ahead. For the banks, they're just like, yeah, no, you yeah. need you need some sort of receivables on paper. Right. And same thing, also, if you want to get an investor, if you want to get uh, you know a partner, you want to sell it, whatever it might right. be, it's it has a ton of value. So. Yeah, good yeah. you got them in place. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the other side, too, the uh, you have to sell people every month. Like, if you don't like sales, do contracts. You only have to sell them one time right. a year. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. And yeah. then, But if you don't do contracts, you're having to sell constantly. Yeah. Mm. It yeah. simplifies things 
Yeah. It, it allows you to approach the entire intake and sales process much more authentically because really you want it to be a longer term commitment. You're not trying to be like, well, come and dip your toe in and we'll see how it goes. And that like whole wishy washy thing, you're just playing into the things that have caused them likely to be unsuccessful thus far. Right. And setting yourself up for failure. And not to mention you have to keep selling and selling and selling, like hoping I, I, don't, I don't screw up or I get this right and they don't <laughs> just leave tomorrow. Right. Because they've, they have emotionally committed to something longer already, too. Right. So their buy in, their range, and how they're picturing this whole thing is already much further out than just I'm technically on a month to month. You know, I could just waltz. Well, and the other thing too is the only reason we didn't do contracts is a fear that I placed that didn't even exist that people wouldn't like that. But people are so used to contracts with gyms anyway that when I when we started them it was like, okay, there was no argument. That what I had thought in my head was going to be this big argument, there was none. They're like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Here's the option, 12-month, uh, six-month, or month-to-month, month, but then the month-to-month's, you know, higher. And they're like, oh, that makes sense. So I'm here for the 12-month. And I was like, hey, babe, we got <laughs> a 12-month contract. It, you know, It <laughs> feels good, right? It does. And that's yeah. one thing you said in that podcast was wait till you get that first contract, and you'd be like, oh. And that's yeah. how it was. It was like, I can count on that revenue for 12 months, right? And so that's exactly the experience we had. It's the fear of rejection that is, and that, like, I, I don't want to be the, the bad guy to say, yeah, but we've got a contract and the yeah. terms are super shitty. And, like, <laughs> <laughs> remember. You specifically designed them to be right. shitty. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and I really don't believe in it, so I'm having a really hard time presenting it. The truth is it's your business. Yep. You can make the rules whatever you want, and as long as you can make sure it's legal in your state and it's a win-win and it makes sense to the client where they're like, yeah, that makes sense, and you're yeah. like, cool, right? Here's it, you know, and you can obviously structure discounts around whatever you want it, want it to be, but um, it's it's not a negative thing. Right. You know, people think they're like, I'm going to put this out there. Everyone's going to hate me, and mm. no one's ever going to buy membership ever again. It's just like, dude, you just need to adjust how you are – presenting what you're doing and make sure that the contracts are something that don't feel shitty and that you personally believe in and can buy into so that you're confident when you present it and there you go. Yeah. And it feels good for both, yeah. right? You forget it's a win-win. Someone yeah. committing to their health now for six months, 12 months, like I said, they're going to be buying in for something bigger rather than just like, well, I'll sign up. I'll do this for a few months. We'll see how it goes. No, nothing's going to change in 90 days or at least not enough is going to change in 90 days. Yep. That's right. right. That, and that's yeah. what we noticed, too. It was, it was easy. It was not hard at all. Yeah, it's a prime example of letting – we let our imaginations mm-hmm. run wild with what we think other people are going to experience in these situations. Yep. And we're almost always wrong. And so we shouldn't believe everything we're thinking. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. So that was uh, that was another – so the contracts, the figuring out the, um, the coaching structure um, – one of the things has been like uh, working and controlling with class and, and uh, getting the right coaches in place. Um, you know, it, like I said in the beginning, it was just a real quick trade. Anybody who was interested in getting their level one, and that's who we put in place. And then, but they're not all cut out for that. They may have the knowledge, but but the class is an experience, right? Mm-hmm. So we actually look more for the coach's personality than their knowledge, because mm-hmm. the truth is, a a student that comes in will get a great workout. And if the coach isn't the most knowledgeable coach ever, but can coach safely, but has an amazing experience for the member, that's the success. Because yeah. then they keep coming back. You know, I, I always tell people, we could be world-class trainers, but if we're assholes, nobody uses it, and then nobody's going to get the results. So it doesn't matter how awesome of coaches we are. Mm-hmm. But if we're decent coaches and you love to be here, then you're going to have an amazing experience and the results will come because now you want to be there five days a week. Yeah. You make it a priority to show up because you have a great time. Yeah. So yeah, you can, cause you can teach them how to be a better coach, right? But you can't change someone's personality or attitude if they right. are just not, a, if they're not a people person and yeah. they just, they don't feel comfortable in, in a, the group environment and you can just tell that they don't love doing that, but they may love CrossFit. Right. That doesn't mean they're going to be a great coach or right. they're super technically sound, but personality sucks yeah it's not going to go anywhere it doesn't matter how good of a coach you are if someone doesn't want to hear it right hear it from you yeah exactly right? um do you guys know who lonely island is the uh mm-hmm. the saturday night Sounds live like a music place video many yeah. Times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're hilarious. they have a video <laughs> called song. shy ronnie i don't know that you one gotta okay. look up shy ronnie that's okay. what i call new coaches because when they coach you're like you you, you, you know and so <laughs> you gotta okay. they, so once you watch you be like yes that's every new coach is a shy ronnie so when you watch the video you're like yep 
That's exactly right. So I'm, I always tell my coaches, don't be shy Ronnies. And I, <laughs> they all know who it is because I've played the video for them. So anyway, get it, go look at it up if you get a chance. You'll we'll, we'll have to embed that, that yeah. video <laughs> yeah. on, on the blog post with the episode. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Every coach every coach out there will know exactly what I'm talking about once they see it. Like, yep, that's a new coach. <laughs> so we mm -hmm. went down the, uh, the contracts rabbit yep. hole. Where were we? Before we got, you, you were we, we were on a track. Yeah, and then I was like, "Oh, contract." You were asking me the the <laughs> different challenges we've seen as we've grown. So um, I think it was Dark's question. I derailed. Oh yeah, you did. Yeah. Good way great. to go. Good team. Attributing Good my team. question to Mike. <laughs> this is, Sorry. Great question, this is, this Mike. Great question. How most of our relationship works. <laughs> yeah. I say something smart, and they're like, "I think Mike said that." And I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> I, what uh, stupid what I like, going home. Uh, <laughs> what, what I love is when I quote Gandhi and then people attribute it to me. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the best. <laughs> That's awesome. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, other things that we've dealt with is uh, oh the the cost to get out of our location to come here. Mm. I man, I wish I would have heard some of your guys' stuff talking about that early on because we paid seven thousand to leave the contract early just to get here because we couldn't expand. That's the, the reason we left the old place was because we had that L shape and the other people weren't moving and there was nowhere else for us to expand in that in that place and we we needed to or we, at least we thought we needed to. Um, you know, looking back, we could have made three thousand square feet work, but it was a crappy building. So we ended up buying out of our contract for $7,000 while going in and absorbing another larger expense, right? So uh, that was a learning curve. Now we just we pay a lot more attention to the leasing agreements and also discovering now that uh, people that own these properties want you there instead of it's um, – it's flipped, right? My, my my old way of thinking was that I wanted to be there and they didn't really care if I was there. Now I realize that they want you there, especially facilities like this, because you're a destination location, which will provide value for the other businesses around. And so now the negotiating power is actually more in the favor of the affiliate. Well, you are creating daily traffic with the same people. So if there's, yep. a, there's a Starbucks, mm -hmm. like, you know, 50 feet away, man, you just bump their revenue. Yeah. Yeah, this place has a salad and go right next door. And the other building, the other businesses are struggling to keep people coming in there. So now I, when I talk to the landlord that we're negotiating with for the new the new place, I said, "Look, I've got almost 200 members. We our goal is to be over 300 in the next, you know, 12 months to, to to 18 months, and they will be showing up almost every single day our, you know, as a gym, I want my I want to see three an average of at least three classes a day." is what I'd love to see. Uh, obviously, I'd love to see 100%, but we really push and encourage our members so that we, you know, we're not a Globo gym. We want to see everybody. So we're going to have at least 150 to 200 people at that point showing up in that complex every single day. And that's especially the struggling areas. Like if you go into a shopping center that is got a lot of vacancy, they're begging for something like that. So if you go into that conversation with that, then they're like, okay, how can we get you here? What can we, I mean, he even showed up here with his card, the owner of the complex, mm -hmm. and I, I wasn't here, but he's so interested in making it work, knowing the value we're going to be bringing into to the complex. So that's that's another thing we've learned is that we actually have the power in the negotiation more than we give ourselves credit for, especially when you have an established business. You guys using mm -hmm. a broker? Um, yeah, we are. Yeah. For, uh, some friends that were referred to us, so. Yeah, I, I find a lot of times people uh, – wait too long to start using a broker they get in a conversation so uh after you start negotiating is the wrong time to introduce a broker to the situation yeah, yeah. <laughs> like ha let them start the the entire conversation because if you bring them in afterwards then it just it you shot yourself in the foot yeah um, and we could go down a they know you're a rookie one. yeah right yeah. right yeah so. that it start the init conversation is was initiated by the broker which made it easy and and then they can also you know decipher some of the legal talk that i don't that I don't get because I'm busy worrying about other stuff. So that, you know, when they're on your side, they're like, okay, this is what this means. Mm. And then they can help me figure out, okay, because we, we want to have a smooth transition. When we leave this building, I don't want to close. I want to be able to have build out done so that when this is closed, we move in there. So now we're to the point where the owner of the new building, he's like, well, what if I pay your rent at your current place while you're doing build out and, and then you move into here? Cause he wants to even get me in before my lease is up here. Cause 
we sold him so much on the, the benefit of having us there that he, now he's like in a hurry. He's like, well, can I cover your lease and just have you come over here? And he's like, whatever storage yeah. stuff we have, we'll move over there and just, I'm like, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> Let's <laughs> that talk sounds, about that. That sounds perfect. Yeah. Dude, so, you can pay for I'm more gonna, stuff if you want. Yeah. <laughs> you can come over to San Diego. I have and, stuff to pay for. Uh, we're going to do a lease soon. We, got, we need you to come uh, <laughs> negotiate that for us. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So Take a break real quick. I want to find out uh, what your obsession with golden roosters are. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, guys. My name is Aaron Brewer. I'm the owner of 734 Strength and Performance in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Before starting the Barbell Logic System, the struggles that we were dealing with here at 734 Strength was exposure mainly. It was real difficult to get people to our gym. So that was when I really started to realize that we needed to make a change. For the longest time, I thought it was maybe our location. But uh, just started to dig a little bit more and then realize our website wasn't as good as it should be. We weren't doing any type of marketing. So just started to dig into those points. So they kind of got me to the point, to, to our break, to the break point where I talked to our staff, talked to my wife and just realized that I needed to make a big change because if I didn't, the gym was going to continue to go nowhere. For about two years, we were spinning wheels. We weren't really gaining any new members. We were at about 60 members for two years. So that was just putting stress on the family. Uh, it wasn't allowing us to buy new equipment. It wasn't allowing me to pay the co our, our coaches here like they should be paid. So that was the break point. I, I basically just said, I said, look guys, I hope you guys are on board with me. I'm gonna make a big change here. And that was right when I started to really look into the logic system and, and I knew that that's what I needed to have done and I, I needed to sign up and, and get the logic system working here in 734 Strength. Implementing Barbell Logic into 734 Strength and Performance has been really painless. It's, it's taken about, it took about a month to get things going, but during that time I was in constant communication with the design team, the marketing team. The website is really easy to, to navigate, really easy to do updates with. Uh, Infusionsoft has been a little easier than I anticipated. Um, and just overall, the, the people that you're going to work with are you know, some of the best in the industry. So as long as you put your faith in them and just know that they're going to help you because they actually care about you, they want your business to do well, uh, implementing this into your, into your gym and into your box will be very easy. The benefits and the results of the Barbell Logic System have actually been uh, pretty unbelievable. We've been running the system now for about two months and we've gained 20 members within that two month span. We've also uh, have been able to get a lot more exposure to our gym. We are getting two to three new inquiries each week. So the exposure has definitely went up. I think the main reason for that exposure is just the website that the Logic System was able to develop for us. It really sets us apart in a field where CrossFit gyms are continually popping up. So it allows us to build relationships with our potential members before they even get to us. So that's been huge. Automated eBooks, automated emails, the Infusionsoft marketing system. Um, it's allowed me to step away and really devote more time to developing the business, developing programs with, within our gym, spending more time with our coaches to make sure that they're happy. Uh, it has allowed me to um, decrease my stress levels because I'm not trying to write emails all the time. Uh, the, the Infusionsoft system will take care of that for you. There's emails that get sent out daily that I'm not even aware of that are getting sent out. These emails are amazing too. I um, give continual compliments on the emails that our current members have received, our potential members that also are just blown away with the professionalism that, that we've been able to present them. I wish I would have started this a year ago if I would have known about it. So if you're even thinking about it, if it's if you're kind of on the fence going back and forth, I would tell you if you want to start to develop your business now, sign up now. Don't continue to wait. Find a way to implement the Barbell Logic system into your business. I can almost guarantee you, just from my own personal experience, that you're going to be blown away that uh, you'll be like me and wish that you have been able to start it, start it sooner. Because like I said, as soon as you start it, things are gonna start to improve. Um, so we left off with, I mean, we went down some, some trails <laughs> there, yeah. and, but we left off with, you know, some of the challenges, so. Uh, the last thing what we were talking about was uh, the lease and, and right. getting out of that. So, yep. Is there anything else uh, that you think gym owners need to be hearing 
uh, um, that, that you, we may have not covered yet, like the big pitfalls. The only thing we're currently working on handling right now is scheduling. So, like, our class is light today, but we do have 20 every every afternoon in, in all three classes. So one thing we're trying to figure out right now for us is do we require a check-in and we cap it at a certain number? I have the space in here for 25 people per class, but we've never enforced any sort of, like, lining up, like dress right dress. People are kind of free-for-all. So now it, it is hard. And so one of the things we're, we're developing right now is the ability to show our members, okay, look, there's a painted logo on the floor. You stand there, and then we'll all fit just fine. But we've never enforced that because we weren't growing like we were. And now we're growing, and so now we're like, okay, hey, look, we want 20 people in here because that means business is good. So instead of telling people, no, only 16 in a place that's plenty big for 20, let's let's uh, work together and find a way to get everybody in here because they also really enjoy that energy. When there's 20 people in class, this what? place is humming. You know, it feels good. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and, and that's one of my favorite things in, in a CrossFit workout is having 20 people just dropping bars and just moving between people. And so, yeah. Good so, energy. Yeah. So that's what we're working on right now and, and we'll we're we're getting it figured out. People are starting to line up and you two coaches things. per class? That's the that was the next thing is like we had two weeks where I was making sure it didn't because we've had it go up and we and we did implement a sixteen cap with one coach mm. and then the next week we never hit sixteen. So we didn't need our SVP anymore. So I've been watching and we've been consistent twenty people for two weeks every day of the week except Thursday. So now I'm gonna be the second coach. Four, four, five, and six p.m. Just so we have enough eyes on, right? That's mm-hmm. the next step: is making sure that it's being trained safely and people aren't being overlooked. Yeah, yeah. So, you guys got a lot of competition in the area. Is that, um, that grown over the last five years? It's actually declined. We've had three over or four. the last five years. It's declined. Yeah, it, I mean, in the beginning when we opened, it was like boom, 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 boom. Gyms yeah. open up right up, run one right after the other. Yeah. In the last two, three years, there's been four or five affiliates close. Hmm. So the people who did it as a hobby thing, it was going to be quick, easy money. They're gone. The ones who are in it to make it a living and want to be a part of the community and really care about this type of stuff, they're still around. And we're investing in new ways to make it better, like getting into Barbell Logic. It's like, okay, let's quit dicking around and let's do something that's going to make an impact. And if you're doing it for a hobby, the idea of investing in something like this is you just because you're not in it for a business. Mm -hmm. But we're like, yeah, look, we're in this as a business. Let's do things that businesses do, which is invest in the infrastructure. And so... That's why we got into Barbell Logic. So, awesome. And that's what's why the, we're still around. What's the biggest change that came with uh, implementing Barbell Logic? Oh, the the uh, the ability for them to be funneled through. Because I sign up as well to get the emails they get, and so just knowing the kind of information they're getting, and now like we uh, when I talked with you and we st- implemented the uh, on ramp right away, um, we had the first week of on ramp. I had only three or four people, which is what we talked about keeping it controlled and nice and so anybody called i got them in the on-ramp uh they all signed up the end of the first week the next week did the on-ramp again they all signed up the end of that week so it's like the conversion rate is huge because they're getting so much good quality information through the automatic email system that by the time it's time to make a decision there's no questions they're like oh this is what this place does and they held my hand through the first week Mm -hmm. and i'm ready to go so. Yeah, and you've had automatic, uh, automated email systems set up previously, but they didn't get used very well. No, they did not. Not not to the effectiveness of this that this is. And those were only for existing members, not even leads. So when leads come in now, that's where the value is in, in converting those. So yeah. did you build the one by yourself before? Where'd you, where'd you get that? Um, yeah, it was uh, it was an Infusionsoft program that we tried to do on our own that mm. just we couldn't utilize it to our full ability because i mean it takes a team to really make an impact with infusionsoft is great but unless you're invested in like making it your life's work for the next however (laughs) long it took you guys which we recognize and i because i had rush club and because i was trying to run the gym to sit down and develop infusionsoft program like it is with you guys is just i couldn't put it together so yeah, yeah, it's super powerful software. But if if you have to build the whole thing yourself, it's going to take a lot of time. Yeah. And if you're running a gym and trying to do it at the same time, it's it's a full time gig either way. Right. And so building by yourself is just going to bog you down. If you're doing yeah. something that's not not that important compared to actually like, you know, giving your members the best experience possible. Exactly. Well, and we even and we even had a member have a member who works for one of the number one companies that helped build out infusionsoft programs he was he was there for us he's like just give me get me this these things and you know that pro he's done programs they cost like sixty thousand dollars to have him build it out 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he was really he was willing to help me with a lot of that. But to sit down and write every individual email, create the video content like you guys have. I mean, all of this stuff because he's like, look, I'll teach you how to do what I do for these other people I work with. Yeah. And I'll help you with it. But I didn't have 60 grand and I also didn't have that much time. So just it didn't work. Yep. And now, now that I'm using Logic, I'm like, oh, that's what was available if I would have put in the work because it's working so so well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's it's always a, a gross underestimation on what it actually takes to build something as comprehensive as yeah. Logic. People are like, oh, you know, so it's a, it's a good-looking site, and then I've got some automation for my lead management and maybe some campaigns here and there. It's like, no, you don't understand. This literally is thousands <laughs> of hours of, like, professional Infusionsoft developers and business strategists, like, crafting and molding and tuning you don't have to do anything yeah you just show up and it's like what's your business model let's refine your strategy let's build the system accordingly and meanwhile you're doing what you're doing every day yep. and then you rolled out and you rolled out pretty quick too i think you were like um under a couple months or something like that yeah we it, i felt like it took me forever because i had so much going on but we did get it up and running in about six weeks i think yep yeah and for you i remember when we did our strategy session there was we you had a lot of good things already happening mm-hmm. and we just kind of went through and did some kind of tweaking and tuning and shuffling around. What was your experience like going through kind of that evolution? Oh, it was great. I felt guilty because we, they were waiting on me. It, what that's what, But that's a testament to your guys' team, right? They were waiting on me to get what they needed and the second they got it, it was up. And then they're like, okay, how about this? And so like, my coach's photos, for example, took me like three weeks just to organize and coordinate and get the right photos so that they could be loaded and then edit those. And so your team was like over there like, hey, and like always friendly, but like, hey, where are they at? Together, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I know they're <laughs> and I know they're over there like with that thing, like waiting to be checked off so they can move on. I'm like, we got, oh. we got a picture of your face over there and like yep. just like drawing clowns. <laughs> Harass this <Yeah>. man. <laughs> <laughs> Harass this man. This fucking guy. <laughs> and, and what about the process with like the, the business strategy? Because you and I did we did a couple yeah. of calls, right? right. So we, we really kind of dug deep on like right. where you know where you're at, what do you actually want this thing to look like? Yep. And like the 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 tweaking and tuning of the the strategy itself. Yeah. How is that affected? Because that's that's always I think also something that's uh, underestimated. Right. Like the optimization of mm-hmm. really the overall strategy and making sure you are even doing the right things to serve you and your clients best. Right. Two main things. Like I said, one was the on ramp program, which I I didn't want to do. I didn't think I could do because we have full classes at night, and so I'm like to do a six o'clock class with three or four more people in here. And then you're like, hey, look, we've done it in 33,000 square feet. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, shit. <laughs> I guess we can make it work. It's so, not valid. Yeah, exactly. And and it works so well, right? And and to do it like you suggested, we did it three days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then they're done. And we even have it set up to where Friday is an initial sort of quick lecture, and then they actually – I walk them over to the regular class. Mm-hmm. So Friday is like mm-hmm. a soft launch into classes. Integration. And it worked really well that way. So that's, they all, like I said, they've all converted 100%. Um, then the other thing that we talked about was, um, dang it, it slipped my mind. Uh, you, you gave me a lot of stuff, but specifically, oh, the the upsell mm-hmm. on the on-ramp program. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that that's going over well. And we, we even had two people pay $99 just for the three days. And my wife's like, what? They're paying 99 bucks for three classes? And I'm like, yeah, Marcus said that's what it's worth. And they didn't want to sign a <laughs> membership. So I charged them 99 bucks for the three days and, and a couple. So we, we made almost 200 bucks for a three-day class. And now at the end, they signed up. And I told them, if you guys decide to do it, we'll convert it over. Mm-hmm. But they wrote a check for 200 bucks for two people to try three classes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, removing a fear that I had that wasn't valid. Right. That somebody might not see the value and just really focus on the value, and they're like, "Yeah, let's do that." Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, I, I was actually I was hanging out with uh, AJ Roberts the other uh-huh. day up in uh, he he just moved to Vegas, and uh, we were talking about you know who who's deciding the value here, and you know I got the conversation went to you know the customer decides the value. Yeah. So you, you as the owner is not are not responsible for setting the value. You can set the price. Right. But it's the customer that goes, I value this right. for that price, and I will now exchange you. So if you want to get into this whole headspace of value, it's yeah. it's their responsibility. You set the price, but the price doesn't mean anything until they until they start paying. Yeah. And you may be surprised at how much people value your service. Right, right. You know? That's the other thing. I don't want to skip over this because one of the coolest things that's happened is, and I told you guys this, is the personal training client that came in from – 
the professionalism of the site. You know, first client, he owns a half a billion dollar car company. And he's like, and he specifically said, your site is very professional. And, and you know, you, you don't make that kind of money without being a detail guy. So that said a lot of right off the bat about that. And that was just our initial phone call. And, you know, for me, I'm, I don't do a lot of personal training because I'm really busy. So mm-hmm. I said, you know, it's 100 bucks an hour. If you want me to coach you, it's 100 bucks an hour. And he didn't even bat nine. He came in, he paid for 20 sessions up front. Yeah, okay, like, I mean, if you own a half a billion dollar car company, you're not looking for the second best CrossFit no. around, or like, <laughs> or like middle of the you're road, or, or, the second or, best anything. or whatever's right. closest. Like you want the fucking best one. And right. What are you gonna do? You're gonna Google it. And you're gonna go to the first website, and you're gonna say, uh, "How do how do I feel about this?" And yeah. you're gonna you're gonna open up a bunch of tabs of all the CrossFit gyms in the area, and you're gonna say, "Oh, that one looks fucking super pro. I'm going there." <laughs> that's right, and that's that's how he, that's how I got the initial conversation. Mm-hmm. Then it's up to me, right? Yep. Then it's the process, the yes. offer. Yep, and and in the conversation with him was like, hey, look, you you own a half a billion dollar car company, my rate's a hundred bucks an hour, but if there's I no charging val- you like five hundred bucks, I, an I told hour. him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what I told him was, I said, but is a hundred bucks an hour worth it for you to be invested in your your what you're looking for? I'm like, because I'll charge you more. <laughs> That's what I told him. I said I'll charge you more, but you got to tell me what the value is. So uh, we didn't we didn't have a set deal done. I just knew he was coming in for his first meeting, and he walked in and he gave me two grand. He's like, "Here you go, and pay for twenty sessions." And that wasn't even our our arrangement. But he goes, "This makes me committed." I'm like, nice. great, nice. So. You know, I was actually, <laughs> I was actually on my way to get a job driving Uber because I mm-hmm. because of the businesses I'm doing right now. We're in this like really awesome growth phase, but they're not making a ton of money. And with some sacrifices we've made to invest in things and in infrastructure and that kind of stuff, and buying out our partners, it's like I'm not I'm not making enough here to to have it all meet. So for that guy to, I mean, that literally saved my ass. I was going to be driving Uber to make ends meet. Had he not seen the website, had that not worked, then him throw down. Two thousand dollars. So it just, it uh, it made a massive impact, not just on me and my gym, but my family made yeah. a huge impact. Yeah. So, awesome. yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're going hard in a lot of different directions, and, <laughs> and yeah. you know, there's a lot of people who open up gyms, and the gym is the only thing they're working on, and and it actually does make it much easier. Yeah. To have that consistent cash flow, but if you're opening up, if you have all these different projects going on, yep. and then. If you're like me, you know, we like to start like five things at once <laughs> yeah. and then and then watch the money drain and then go, oh, shit. And then <laughs> and then, you know, learn that lesson. And we don't we don't do that anymore. Right. Um, but and it sounds like you've you've hit this this flux in both businesses where you're taking a dip and, and yeah. that creates that sometimes. Um, tell tell me about what inspired you to start Rush Club. Uh The first inspiration was the fact that I was seeing all of these athletes put so much heart and soul into what they were doing and only one, only two people being compensated for it at the end. So, which is fine, but there was, there's no, there's no other uh, really revenue stream for an athlete. I I listened to a podcast with an athlete who trained, who worked two full-time jobs one year just so she could save one year and then compete the whole next year. I think it was on Mm -hmm. your guys' podcast. Uh, Maybe. So anyway, I heard that and I was like, that's crazy. And then you might not even win. You got to win first place at the CrossFit Games to have that even make a difference. So um, the idea of doing head to head competition came up and I was like, look, if we can create like the UFC version for functional fitness for this for athletics like this and and make it entertaining, then we can give as many divisions have people to compete in. They can all make a living. Right. So right now we have 19 divisions. Someday when a million plus people are watching the show and they're paying a pay-per-view stream, that division, depending on their character and their draw, can be a six figure, seven figure income for one of 19 divisions. So that's initially what started was like I was seeing all these guys, people on your guys's podcast with Barbell Shrug working so hard. And then ultimately they're getting paid in granola bars. You know, it's like damn that's a that's a hard life but they're so committed to it and i felt these were the hardest training athletes of any sport in the world there's no off season even fighters they train their ass off but they still have a little bit of a down season between fights not in functional fitness not in crossfit if you're going to the games you like after the games you got 2 weeks off and it's like okay let's go back to work and and there was no uh compensation for that so rush club was a way to inspire people to 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 watch because of the athletes that were there showing what's possible right and uh and that's how it started and then to be honest with you guys you know the last it's been hard for four years we've been working at this 
uh, we've always had growth, always had momentum, but it's it's not been easy. And so there's times where I'm like, why am I doing this? And then I get emails about, you know, uh, somebody who was inspired and they started exercising. Or, you know, one mom messaged us, um, their daughter saw uh, our adaptive athletes competing and their daughter was like five years old and she would never wear a dress because she had a prosthetic leg and was embarrassed by it. And then saw the girls competing and then they're like, her daughter wore a dress the next day. Oh, wow. <laughs> like, yeah. what? Well, I'm not doing this for me anymore. I'm not. Because I would be, I, if I put all my focus into my gym, we'd have 300 members in the next 6 to 12 months, guaranteed. And I'd, my wife and I would be able to do vacations. She wouldn't be working full time. Life would be so simple if I wasn't doing Rush Club. But then I would be giving up on all of these people and, and all the others who still haven't seen it yet. And then I just want them to go into places like this. That's... Athletes get what they're doing. They get paid for it. The people watching find this, and we stop childhood diabetes and ob obesity, and we end some major chronic disease issues. We just want to contribute to what's already be been started with uh, Glassman and his crew. We just want to contribute, and entertainment is how you do that. You have to entertain people for them to watch. You just do. Yeah, mm -hmm. we figured that out. Yeah, yeah you got to throw in <laughs> some jokes here and there. Yeah. Keep people <laughs> interested. Yeah, right, right. So. So that's uh, that's the passion behind Rush Club, and I've got an amazing team. It's definitely not a solo act. I'm I'm the guy in the microphone, the guy that promotes it. But if it wasn't for my the, uh, one of my gym managers, here's the cool thing about the gym too. A hundred percent of the success of Rush Club came because we're we're teamed up with people who came from this gym. People would come up to me like, "Hey, by the way, this is what I do," and I'm like, "Yeah, I could use that." We want to do like creative direct. Our creative director is Emmy nominated, and I had no idea. He's like, "Hey, I, I do this. If you want help, I was Emmy nominated for an Emmy." And I was like, "What? Yeah, I want you to do that." So <laughs> now he probably wishes he never said that because I've used him more than anybody. <laughs> and uh, but everybody, my gym manager, she was here, and I said, "I've got this really great idea to go head to head fitness, but I am not an implementer. I'm an idea guy. I am not the implementer. Can you help?" And she said, "Let's do it." Yeah. So. Even though I might be the face of the company, without Stacy, Rush Club doesn't exist because ideas are nothing without actual execution and implementation. Yeah. So it's it's a hundred percent of our team in Rush Club came as members of here. And now we actually have a policy that you don't work with us unless you do functional fitness CrossFit somewhere. It doesn't have to be my gym, but you have to because I have this belief that if you're willing to get your ass kicked so hard and put yourself put yourself in that environment to suffer, you can handle some of the other things that show up outside of the gym. So because every time we've had to replace somebody, it, it, it 100% the same common denominator is they don't do functional fitness. They don't do CrossFit. 100%. Now, I'm not saying there ain't people out there can that can be successful at it, but our experience is in the growing of this business, if they didn't do CrossFit, they didn't last. Yeah, this sounds like mm -hmm. a very in, uh, important culture piece when people, I think uh, the word culture gets thrown around and conversations about business and there might be a little bit of confusion and we talk about your core values being the core of that culture. Mm -hmm. And then there are things like that, like what you're talking about right now. It's like, no, we all do. Right. We all do CrossFit or some type of functional that's fitness right. program. And we have that in common. And that's one of the things that bonds us together. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. So... Cool. So what's next? Yeah. Where, where, are, you, where are you heading would you, from, from this day forward? Oh yeah, where, tell where, us where are you guys going? <laughs> I was going to say, would you like to know about the Golden Cock? Mike asked yes, that. The one. Golden <laughs> cock. And what Please, about this rooster on your for, shirt? For, for, pre for people that are just listening to the audience don't know that Rush Club's <laughs> like, mascot, so to speak, is, is a golden cock. Yes. They just heard you say, you want to hear about my golden cock? And, they, and it came out of total nowhere. Uh, I'm just There's cameras there the whole time, so I forgot there's only an audio version. So <laughs> it's perfect. Please tell us about your cock. Uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to do so. Um, I'm I'm very proud of it. Uh, so we, uh, <laughs> I actually, <laughs> I grew up on a ranch, and mm -hmm. the one animal you don't mess with on the ranch is the rooster. Like you can mm -hmm. get, you can get kind of close to the bull and not get, not have him mess with you if he doesn't care. But the rooster, you go anywhere near him, he's coming after you, right? So they, they just kind of every time you see him, there's a, there's a picture of one that's like completely defeathered, like, and he's still strutting like he's the king. So. <laughs> Uh, so it was a fitting symbol, right? And I thought, man, if you if you win Rush Club, if you win a head to head, you're the king cock. You're the king of the roost, right? Mm -hmm. And so a little bit of bragging rights. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but um, 
the other side of the story, though, is in astrology, the rooster is the heralder of the gods. It brings the message, right? And, and our big focus is getting people inspired to go do fitness. And so the athletes, our whole focus is getting the athlete's story out there. It's not about Rush Club. Just like any other business, it's not about the franchise of the business. People don't care about UFC. They're, as a matter of fact, their numbers drop when it's not somebody fighting that everybody cares about, right? right. Any sport. Mm -hmm. The Chicago Bulls weren't so popular back in the 90s because it was the Chicago Bulls. It's because they had Jordan Pittman and Rodman. It was the people they had. So we tell the stories where the, the roosters, the heralder of the gods, we're telling the stories of these athletes, what they've gone through to get there, what kind of sacrifices they make to play at that level. And because Rush Club is able to feature people of so many different abilities, lightweight, middleweight, heavyweight, in the women's division, we started flyweight because there's some awesome athletes out there that are females that are that, that are less than 130 pounds, so they maybe can't qualify for a high-level competition like the CrossFit Games, but they're still impressive athletes. They need yeah. a division, right? Even men, right? Mm -hmm. watching, uh, watching Josh Bridges try to pull that four, 405 or 455 in 2012 and fail that segment because that's a lot of weight for somebody who weighs 160 pounds, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, so anyway, creating those ab the ability for those divisions to happen, and then we implemented adaptive athletes. Adaptive athletes, they're amazing, but there's not a there's not a right scenario for them to be fully recognized for their abilities. Um, all all of the competitions that are kind of out there are like you know when you have somebody missing an arm going against somebody missing a leg, it's not an equal competition. Right. You, know, you get Derek Carver, the world's strongest adaptive man, that shows up to a competition like that. He's going to win. It's not an equal competition. In a head to head competition, though, I've got below the knee, above the knee, above the elbow, below the elbow, and wheeled. Now we can program responsibly for those specific adaptations. Mm. And that's been a learning curve, right? We put a below the knee versus above the knee, and the guy that was missing his leg above the knee had to strict uh, snatch. 95 pounds while having two levers made a huge difference. We're like, oh, note to self, two different divisions. <laughs> you know, and so it's just been an evolution. But now you're seeing a stage. Yeah, I mean, that's quite the challenge. Congratulations. Yeah. That's like, <laughs> seriously, that's a lot to think about. It and is. People probably have not stopped to even think about it. The, yeah. yeah it, we've How many variables there are there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and it's the right space and it's the right place. And now you can, you'll, you know, look, we, we are a stage for people to have equal billing regardless of where they are if they've earned it. I, you know, frankly, I have people call me, hey, I want to compete. I'm an adaptive athlete. I'm in a wheelchair. And I go look at their profile. I'm like, and you're a fat ass. Go to the gym. <laughs> right? It's like <laughs> they've been so used to being catered because that's they let anybody, let, people let anybody play. And I'm like, no, listen, we are an elite level competition. You have to qualify. Hey, I'm the same weight as freaking uh, – uh, Conor McGregor, I should get a shot. No, I didn't qualify to be there. I yeah. should have to qualify to be there. It's no different now, and it, it's a learning curve. People are like, oh, okay. But that's what keeps the value because I don't let just anybody show up. You had to earn the right to be there in the first place, and so that's how we do it. And, it's yeah, it's a lot of work. I just We just had this last weekend we had our first women's wheelchair title, and uh, uh, <laughs> after, the sh after the show was over, I got an email from one of the – Dot, one of the girls that competed, her mom, <laughs> chewing me out that I didn't pair him up with an equal person. <laughs> like, I'm like, well, wait a minute. And she just ripped me a new one. And she was just playing mama bear, right? And I said, hey, I think I pissed your mom off. So, but really, I let the athlete choose the other athlete because there are variables, right? In, in a, For example, if you're in a wheelchair, there's a lot of different levels of uh, ability that put you in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I don't have multiple divisions yeah we don't have enough athletes interested to create a gotcha. division for a t11 t12 and for uh you know a lumbar injury or whatever it's just one it's you're in a wheelchair and in this particular case um the one of the girls had the ability to use a little bit of leverage with her with her legs because she wasn't fully paralyzed mm. and you know it's just the nature of that division we'll, we'll figure that stuff out as we go but yeah. At least we have a place now for people to be recognized. You know, yeah. there's the Olympics and the Paralympics. How much advertisement goes on for the Olympics? And then when the Paralymp Paralympics comes up, it's like, oh, there's that thing happening. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So Rush Club, there's not Rush Club and Para Rush Club. There's just Rush Club, and that's the value we're adding to the community.
Yeah, I like that. So it always a bummer when you go out of your way to do something cool and unique for a very specific group of people, and then they get pissed off at you for doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and I just it was it, she just didn't know, and I said, mm. "Hey, your daughter chose her." That was my response. Your daughter. Mm. I said I wanted her first, and I said, "Who would you take on?" And she said, "I want this girl." I said, "Great, let's do that." Because I don't know. I'm not an expert with those injuries and what they're capable yeah. of. And so, and I, but then I, I had to, you know, I took the, the, the right approach and I said, listen, I assure you we are on the same page that we just want to recognize these athletes legitimately. And, uh, it's a learning curve. And after yeah. that, she's like, okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to have a lot going on. You, yes. got, you got the gym, you got rush club, you yeah. got, a, you got a family, you got, you got a wife, you got kids, you got yeah. the whole deal. Like what, what personal practices do you implement into your life right now that, that keep you in shape, keep you healthy and keep yeah. you where you're not just burnt out and exhausted all the time? Uh, so like I mentioned, my family are ranchers, so I make it a point to hit to the, go to the ranch and move cows with them. I, this thing doesn't work when I'm out there where literally that's the last piece of private property bordering the, the Grand Canyon. It, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, blessed cool. to be a part of that fam to, to have been born into that family. Cause when I need to refresh, that's where I go. And we get on a horseback and we're trailing cows for three, four days. When he's not working, he works to... <laughs> yeah. My, I work to relax. <laughs> yeah. work my uncle's hard I need a break from labor. work. <laughs> I go do some manual labor. Uh, <laughs> really, that's a, actually that's what it feels like. It I is mean. helpful. I've I've gotten in environments where I'm doing physical labor. I'm like, wow, I feel amazing. <laughs> yeah. People who do physical labor for a living are like, what the fuck is wrong with this yeah. person? Yeah. All my cousins are like. We had to be here, and you're having fun. I was like, "Yeah, change your mindset. You'll have fun like me." <laughs> so I'm sure they love that. Yeah, yeah they change your mind, yeah. everybody. You're, you're here once about... every couple of months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> AJ's always getting in fights around the campfire. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> exactly. So uh, doing that, making sure that I give myself time for that to decompress. Um, uh, reading, keeping myself educated, listening to you know powerful books and stuff like that. Um, so I'm not I'm not much of a reader, so I do the audiobook route, and I mm -hmm. haven't done that a ton. But recently, I've made it a point that every at least I'm not a reader. So listening to a book once a month is a huge thing for me, and I tend mm -hmm. to because I rarely find time to absorb that content. When I do, I'm like bringing it all in, right? I just I really pay attention. So I just finished Jocko's book last week, mm -hmm. Extreme Ownership, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've done uh, Ego is the Enemy, which I think I just saw you mm -hmm. post. Yep. Finished that mm -hmm. one the month I'm prior. About, I'm about halfway through that one. Yeah, so. It's good. Doing it, it was timed well for me, too. Yeah. 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 That's good. <laughs> <laughs> His ego, was that an all-time high <laughs> just recently? Chop it down. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Who referred the book to you? <laughs> <laughs> he got like six copies in the mail from all of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was wondering. Yeah, when, when people <laughs> recommend it like every week, you're like, shit, all right. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> That's awesome. Um. Just that, just making time for myself, and then also really making sure I have time for my family, because I do. Mm. I have three daughters, uh, twelve, seven, and five, and you know, it's all for nothing if they're not with me at the end. I've been, I've been really trying to pay attention to the fact that, you know, look, my goal is that Rush Clubs is bigger than the UFC in the next five years, five to ten years. That's the game I'm playing. If I miss it, just short. Okay, I'll be happy with that. I mean, they just sold for four point three billion, so I guess I'll sell for three. <laughs> but, but. You know, my dad said this to me. My, my dad's a really humble, sort of like simple man. And he said, what's success? And, I, and, and he goes, success to me is when your spirituality and your finances and your family are in alignment. That's success. Like you, if you have all the money in the world, but you have no family and you're alone and you don't even know, you, you have no spirituality, that's not success. And somewhere those things aren't matching up. So uh, I've really kind of taken that to heart and like, okay, awesome. If, if I'm super busy as we are becoming, how am I going to make sure I have time to develop my spirituality and develop my relationship with my family? Because when I'm done, I don't want, especially because, you know, Rush Club's in the world of entertainment. I don't want to get to where I'm going and not have my family there with me. Yeah. Because I'm doing, I say I'm doing it for them now. Mm -hmm. And so what good is that if they're not there at the end? Because I neglected to keep that relationship alive, just trying to get there. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. tempting when you've got that much going on, especially when you've when you when you're working on something you're passionate about and something that's getting traction and you're you're making progress, to say you know I'll, I'll spend that time next week, just this next month or just this next period or window. Right. The next thing you know, a year has gone by, two years have gone by, and I, I, I find a lot of entrepreneurs all of a sudden are in a place where they're like, I'm totally disconnected from my family, my wife. So it's way more valuable to 
just chip away at that. Make sure you're yeah. you're leaving those little windows daily for that that are not negotiable. You know, and yeah. you you're able to invest in your family, invest in your spirituality, and and, and the things that are going to fill you up. So you right. can keep moving and it's actually sustainable rather than saying, I'm going to go all out next, you know, five years, but three years in, you know, you, you fall apart, yeah. you know, or something really important, you falls apart, or maybe it's not three years, maybe it's 10, you right. know, but the point is, is like you said, I want to get there and enjoy, enjoy it with all of us together, yes. happy and everything. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Just on the way up here, we were, we were talking about uh, this Ted talk that I was, uh, that I had spoken on, on a different show a little while back where. Harvard just did a study, and they, they studied a couple hundred men for 75 years. And these, these men are still in the study. They're all in their 90s now. And basically, the, the result of the study was that the people that are the happiest and the most fulfilled and that have the greatest lives and the, you know, they're, they're physically the most healthy as well are the people that had the strongest relationships throughout their lives. Mm -hmm. not, just, not just any old relationship, but like they had deep, um, deep emotional connections with the people who mattered most in their lives. And so like that's, that's been a filter that I've been running all my decisions through, which you know, on his face sounds like well, that's such an obvious thing to do, but it, but it's nice to have like for me, I'm a very data driven type person to have something like that to to back up that concept that people are the most important. So as I look for you know financial and business success to make sure that I bring my family along for the ride, because if I keep those relationships strong, it'll actually make me a better business person because I'm happy, I'm not in conflict, I'm not in my head, you know, worried and angry and and all these things that that can happen if you have your your closest relationships break down. So uh, it's nice to hear a reminder from you know, people like you that. You know, Having having your uh, your spirituality, your your family life, and your and your business all like as a part of this little triangle of of stability that makes you happy and fulfilled along the way is uh, something that's very motivating to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Cool. I'm curious. Uh, have there been times where those things were not all aligned? Oh yeah. And I mean, I'm asking because I think most people who are business or in business have gone through these dips they have you have valleys mm -hmm. and peaks where you feel connected to your family and it's yeah. and everything is aligned so yeah. uh have there been times where you've fallen out and what's brought you back oh yeah dude i mean <laughs> that question because i've gone some real serious stuff that's here that almost ended relate my relationship and and uh I mean, that's that that's a whole another long conversation but especially in this environment you know i I'm an open book. If people can learn from me, I'll throw myself under the bus. I really don't care. But I, sp I was spending a lot of time here with a particular member of my gym, and that started dragging me away from my wife, another yeah. woman. Yeah. And that's I, I hear that happen a lot of times mm -hmm. in the gym. And and uh, it's, a, it's a it's a pretty prime thing. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to happen here. Yeah. You're, as you were saying. Yeah. yeah. Very easy. So that that we're all was wearing happening. spandex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Step one. Yeah, right. And, you know, and, and in business, things are stressful. So things not, might not be like pie in the sky at home. And then you think you, you start thinking that things might be better somewhere else. You spend a lot of time with somebody and coaching them, especially if you're doing one on one coaching. And, you know, and so um, I almost got into some really bad trouble that almost ended my marriage. So, yeah, definitely. And then it just it, what it came down to is finding a way to connect again with myself and my own thought processes and realizing that it was that it was a conversation happening in my head and it wasn't real. Mm -hmm. and, and and ultimately when it came down to it, when I had the conversation with my wife about what was going on and how I was feeling, everything I was feeling was like I, I honestly thought that I told my wife because I told her, I said, we're, I'm gonna, we're done. I want a divorce. And I honestly thought her answer was going to be great. Me too. Because I had convinced myself for so many months through different, you know, collecting data. We have a fight. Yep, she must want to be done too. This girl likes me. Collecting data because we had another fight. Yep, this, you know. So I thought when I told her that, she's like, yeah, let's be done. Instead, my wife crumbled. And I was like, oh. And like all of a sudden, all the bullshit I told myself through n not communicating came became clear. And I was like. Uh, I'm the biggest asshole in the world. Like, I cannot believe I even thought that. I, I literally thought she'd be like, yeah, let's be done. <laughs> like, she was going to be totally going, done. Going back too. to the imagination. Yeah. Creating, all yeah. creating a reality for us that may yep. not exist for other people. Exactly. Yeah. And so when she told me that, I was like, oh, shit, what have I done? So I sought out counsel. I sought out some education for my mind. I did a, I've done a lot of training in uh, an organization called Landmark. Mm -hmm. uh, worldwide that was, re was really the reason that Rush Club exists. It's the reason I'm still married. Was, there's a lot of things about what I got there um, because they help you clean that up, that conversation. It, yeah. You know, you realize that that's all just a fake conversation until you actually talk to the person. So that's been some of my experience too. Yeah. And, yeah, 
we've talked a little bit about yep. uh, how you've done Landmark and yeah. what a positive impact is. And I don't think I've ever known anyone to go and just do the one weekend that didn't come away with uh, massive tools right. to, for positive change. Yeah, yeah. Real, that's really all you need. That first weekend, the forum was huge for me. I, I ended up following through with a lot more which I think is great because of the game I'm playing in life with Rush Club. I, I needed to have a bigger connection with the way people communicate. And if what, somebody says this, what does it mean over here? Am I going to add an implied meaning there? Or am I going to take it? You know, there's a lot. You can keep getting more and more education. So Yeah, there's uh, some skills I've learned is just translating for other people. People say things that... <laughs> And, and you're like, oh, they're actually not that great at communicating. Oh, I got to translate what they really mean. Yeah. So yeah. it's like there, there's like the level of learning how to like speak yourself and then also hearing what's really going on for somebody else. Right. And then not you can share what you think the translation might be. It's like, do you really mean this? Is this kind of where you're going? What I'm hearing you say be, is, and then they're yeah, like, no, that's, that's not what I'm saying at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's get clear. Yeah. yeah. So. Anything else you want to share before we roll? No. Appreciate you guys coming out and uh, the work that Logic has done. I mean, you know, it took you told me about it when it first came out. And it took me a long time to get going. Um, we should have done it right off the bat, you know, so because um, it, it did. It's, we've been doing it for three months now. We got leads coming in constantly. They're always ready to go. Kids are running around everywhere. Jim is the gym is bustling, and awesome. uh, I, I really do have a lot of uh, of. We give a lot of credit to what we've been able to develop. It's, investing in our infrastructure made a difference. It took us from a hobby gym to a professional gym, and people are starting to recognize it. So awesome! Yeah. Nice. So thanks. Yeah. So if you're if you're in Phoenix, come out check out CrossFit Mesa or Mesa. Yeah. I mean, Mesa's right here in the Phoenix area. Yeah. And uh, definitely check out Rush Club. Was it RushClub.com? RushClubNation.com. Mm -hmm. RushClubNation.com. Yep. I see. I screwed that up. It's all good. Oh well. <laughs> you guys got a bunch Rush of cool events coming up anyway, so. Check yeah. it out and see what's coming we'll up. We'll have Stay. some announcements on there for sure. Got Super the, high energy are we gonna, events. Can we talk about the thing up north? Uh, which one? Vegas. Vegas, yeah. We did yeah, in we, Vegas. So Las Vegas, the number one entertainment agency in Vegas, has asked us to come there and do a show. The truth of it is we're going to get one shot to make an impact, but they're putting all their money into it. So marketing, advertising, ticketing, everything. So it'll be a full-on Las Vegas production by these guys that um, they're responsible for Venetian, Stratosphere, Caesars Palace. I mean, all these really great locations. So we're going to make a go at it and see if we can create a uh, Rush Club, a functional fitness event in a, as a regular reoccurring Las Vegas production. And if it does well and they, they have certain parameters they're looking for, then there'll be another one. And I, I'm confident it'll do well. We, you know, Our last show, we had 200,000 people watching live. It's doubled every time. The time before that was 100,000. Um, if, if you love Christmas Abbott, which who doesn't? She's a co-host with me on the show, so we have a lot of fun. And uh, so, yeah, check out Rush Club Nation. All the all the all the updates and stuff are, are going to be up there. I mean, we're working on a lot of different things with that. So, what are the dates for uh, um, the Vegas, Vegas show? Vegas doesn't have a date yet, but we're doing our next one, Rush Club Eleven, here in Arizona, April 29th. So you can get information on that. And we're, we're bringing our first uh, international athlete. Uh, his name is Victor uh, Hugo. Asaf, I think is how you say it. He's coming from Ecuador. He's got a brachial plexus injury, so he trains with his arms strapped to his body. And he's going to take on Logan Aldridge, who's our adaptive upper champion. Um, I've been following this kid for 12 months, just waiting for him to have a passport to come up here. He's, he's a monster. Victory is his uh, social media handle. Um, nice. What? <laughs> yeah. How do you snag right. that? Dude. Early mm -hmm. adopter. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he's coming up from Ecuador, and he's going to take on Logan for the title here in April. So Nice. Yeah. Very cool. cool. Killer. And if we want to follow you on social media? Uh, one underscore AJ Richards on Instagram, and then just AJ Richards on Facebook. Yeah. So, if you're in the area, I recommend coming and watching the event live. Uh, if you're too far away, definitely watch the live stream. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Cool. Thanks, dude. Thanks, guys.